Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another issue of the Grey Market Talk on the Tactical Brief with Thorsten Wegener, a retired and still a little bit uh, coronated ex-market maker. And today I have my special permanent guest here, Nick Themistocle, former chief investment officer who was managing squillions, quadrillions and more money than you can even fathom. And this is going to be a live teach-in because I know too little about the European bond market. And we delayed that deliberately because I have a thesis. And I want to run this thesis by Nick. Hi, Nick. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. And the thesis, we waited uh, with this show uh, for Monday because we had local elections in Germany. Hesse and Bavaria went to the polls, and that's a quarter of the German uh, electorate, which was allowed to vote. And um, I find it rather interesting to have a closer eye on that because what the German populace decides will have implications on our economy and of our ability to, well, finance the whole rot we have in the European Union. And without long further ado, I share my screen, which is the official numbers from the elections. You can see them, Nick. I can, but I'm moving on. Okay, so let me quickly run you through. What we see here in front of us is Bavaria, the economic powerhouse of Germany. The CDU is conservatives. They are running locally Bavaria together with, no, we are in Hessen at the moment. I wanted to go to Bavaria. That's where we start. So the CSU, they are conservatives, right? And they run Bavaria with the Freie Wähler, which is also a uh, a center-right leaning party, a relative new party, a collective of normal, hard-working people who had enough of the left policies in there. And they are now in a coalition already for four years. And obviously, it looks as if they're going into the next coalition. But that's not what I want to draw your attention to. The government we have in Germany, which is running the whole show at the moment, the leaders are the SPD, the Social Democrats, which have 8.4% in Bavaria, which is in itself... Uh, rather unbelievable. It used to be the party of Willy Brandt and uh, in recent history of uh, Gerhard Schröder, who actually, uh, well, um, brought Germany out, out of his uh, Cinderella sleep and made it an economic powerhouse through the whole teens. And uh, so the SPD is running the show. They have the chancellor. Then we have the Grüne. Um, I don't think I have to explain the Greens what they want to do and the FDP, the what I used to come from, the real liberals. Yeah, the um, how would you call that? People who defended uh, your own decision making process, who were the controlling part that the state is not getting too overboarding and they are meaningless now. So what you can see here in Bavaria from the conservative side, AfD is the the right wing of the German electorate we have here. That roughly two thirds of Bavarian voters said, no, we do not want to have lefty policies. We are disappointed what's going on at the moment in the government in Germany uh, because we see the economy tanking, we see prices going up and uh, energy prices, we are the highest in the world, taxes, we are the highest in the world. Um, there is no viable path for the future and we had enough of that. You can see that down here, the Greens lost the Freie Wähler the center-right leaning won, the right wing won, and the CSU, which is the opposition, CDU, the opposition in the ge general German government, barely lost anything. Yeah, uh, it's not a good, uh, it's not a good electoral vote they got here, but at least they didn't lose anything. So uh, it is very clear that the voters in Bavaria said, "Don't give us more of this left stuff." Now let's go to Hessen, the other powerhouse, our banking sector, yeah, where it used to be. We have something similar here. The CDU, the uh, opposition of uh, uh, Germany, um, gained 7.6%. The AfD, the right wing, gained 5.3%. And the Greens, the SPD, lost. And the FDP, there was a bit of a struggle. We have this 5% threshold in Germany. They just made it to get into the local parliament. Again, 60% of voters in Hesse want to be not run, let's express it that way, uh, by the lefties. And uh, uh, almost 70% in Bavaria uh, have the same opinion. So what will happen now? We have this phenomenon, phenomen Nick, how do you pronounce it? Phenomenon? Phenomenon. <laughs> phenomenon uh, in Germany that we love to circle the wagons. 
And we don't correct the mistakes we are making. What we do now in the government, as I said, these guys are running the show, the SPD, the Grüne, and the FDP. They will now circle the wagons. They have another two years in government. And in Germany, the default position is if they lose elections, the left, yeah, what is the go-to solution? Oh, we have lost the election for the simple reason we weren't left enough. I've experienced that over and over again. The first go-to is, okay, people are suffering. They've just showed us that at the polls. So what are we going to do now? And we haven't had enough left policies. So let's introduce more left policies. Let's take from the rich and give it to the poor. We all know where this will end. Uh, we Before the show started, we discussed Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher. And Maggie Thatcher had this beautiful line once, eventually you will, you'll run out of other people's money. So uh, that will be the drift. And that's when I started in conversations to have a look at the European bond market. Because what is also hitting the papers at the moment, and that's why I want to get you in, Nick, is Italy. That's the talk of the town, that uh, Italy is yielding now 4.9% on their 10 years, which uh, is, at least for the recent future, not necessarily what we've seen. We've seen Italy almost at 0% interest rates, and that was the general thesis I had when Germany was a strong economy. When we had lots of exports, when we are making lots of tax income and when everybody relied, when the European Union or the European currency was in trouble, that Germany is able to pull the wagon out of the out of the dirt. We don't have that anymore. Or I'm exaggerating here, Nick. That's my big question. What's happening to the basket cases? Sorry, I don't want to call my Italian friends basket cases, but the financial basket cases like Italy, like Spain, the weak nations, and the biggest basket case, deliberately Germany, when we keep on this policy. Will we see interest rates further increase? Will we see spreads exploding? Or am I just making this up? Is this just the storm in a water glass we're seeing here? Well, I was just going to pull up some some uh, um, data points where we can talk about the rate levels now. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, you asked me a while ago, there was this article that hedge funds were shorting Greek bonds, and I said, nothing to see here. Um, and Greek bonds tightened um, after that. And, you know, the elections were okay. And, you know, Greek bonds are actually doing far, far better than they have ever done. They've even been sort of... Um, um, had a, 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 an improved rating from the rating agencies as yeah. well. So, you know, if you look at, you know, what's going on in Europe right now, the, the problems are at the centre. They're not at the fringes, right? So Italy, uh, frankly, are no longer relying on either the ECB or they are relying on the, you know, the the sort of the powerhouse of Europe, Germany, in order to save their economy. And, and you know, Italy, you know, dealing with China, they, they haven't got sort of an anti-China policy, they, 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 their own, they are looking after themselves. If you, if you remember, it was, I think, this time last year, the Italian government um, gave a guarantee, I think it was to NL, yeah. um for a loan now effectively this is um you know normally um you know the the sort of the province of the ecb i mean here you have a country doing its own thing effectively printing its own money um and you know they're not relying on anything central anymore and i think the the you know the the um, peripheral countries and i've you know, I I was asked about this um, uh, about a year or so ago, and I said, I actually like the peripheral countries, and I don't like the central countries. So I would be sort of in favour of, you know, trades which were pro-fringe and um, anti-central. And that worked for a while. And obviously, in the recent um, um, months or so, you actually start to see those spreads widening out, but to levels which historically are still fairly low. They're a million miles away from crisis levels. And, you know, the most important thing, in my view, for, you know, a, a country's bond market is, is confidence in the economy, confidence in its in its government. And, and, and I have to say, when, when I look around the European Union, where do I have least confidence and where do I have more confidence? The least confidence is actually in, you know, sort of government 
France and, and Germany, and, and more confidence is, is around the edges. And, and I would say, you know, it's still that hasn't changed, although the spreads have widened versus Germany in, as I say, in the last few months where the, the sort of the signal, my own signals had uh, changed to bearish, but they've not gone to uh, an, an absolute level where you'd say, there's a real problem going on here. Um, this isn't the kind of, of problems that I see. Um, and I'm certainly not hearing about them. So there's nothing that sort of come on my radar to say that this is uh, something systemic going on, that the 5% or so yield in in uh, in, in Italy is, is going to go suddenly to sort of 7, 8, 9%. Um, I just don't see that right now. So, um, there was an sorry, I know, maybe I'm missing there, something. There, there was an interesting line in The Economist from the weekend. Uh, it was about the weakness in Italian 10 years. And uh, one of the lines I like was, maybe people are not buying them because they don't trust whether they get paid in lira eventually. And I thought, okay, that's an interesting point. They have 144% uh, 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 debt ratio. Um, European Union was originally planned for 65%. You remember that, what they sold us 20 years ago? Yeah, I mean, obviously, all of these Western governments and some non-Western governments, let's, let's be frank. So the Western governments, the you know, the UK, the US um, and Europe, um, you know, have not been keeping their books very well. And, and you know, the pandemic was obviously a big part of that. But they, it was a choice the government had, to, you know, they decided to make for right or wrong reason. They took those uh, decisions at the time. The debt has exploded since then. The central bank added to the problems because the central bank didn't really understand the effect of their policies. So now would they understand the effect of their policies? They are sort of tightening the brakes um, and, um, you know, um, you know, the story goes on with, with higher yields and we worry about the debt burden, but, um, but at the moment, um, it's, we're either at the very, very early stages of really worrying about the debt burden. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've been talking about this for an awful long time and it's, it's a slow process. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, if it was so bad. The euro would be getting trashed. The dollar would be getting trashed. Sterling would be getting trashed. It's, it's kind of a steady decline. Um, and um, Isn't that Oscar Wilde's famous quote, how do you go bankrupt? Very slowly and then very suddenly. That's, yeah, that, that may well be. So this, this whole debt thing is everybody's problem. This is not just the problem of Europe. Um, and or Italy or Germany, it's everybody's, it's China, it's the US. So when you look and you say, well, okay, if everybody can't really go bankrupt together, so you look at the cleaner shirt in, in all of this, yeah. and so everyone says, okay, the cleaner shirt is America. Um, so there's a, there's definitely a, a kind of a, a leaning towards, you know, if I'm going to be somewhere, I might as well, well be over there. Um, I'm not sure whether that's the case, but okay, at the moment, that's certainly leaning that way. Um, but then you have to look at, well, against what? And we had this conversation over the last 20 odd weeks where, you know, th this debt burden, in my view, will be seen um, not by in the collapse of, let's just say, the dollar versus the euro or the euro versus the dollar, but rather these these highly indebted countries versus less highly indebted countries, some very good emerging markets, or commodities. And, you know, but those bets take an awful long time to kind of work out. That's a kind of a long-term macro thing. Don't expect that to work tomorrow. Um, but I think that that's, must be the tendency because the only solution for Germany is more debt. The, it's like you said, more left-wing policies. But the only solution for America is, in the end, more debt. But the right type of debt, the debt that actually can grow uh, the economy to the extent they can repay the debt rather than the debt that they had incurred during the pandemic, yeah. which was just to give to the people to go and buy some stuff or go to the restaurant. Um, you know, that's that's hardly something which will ever um, realistically repay well, that's the, the 1.7 trillion Mrs. Yellen spent uh, this year already, right? Um, because you, you mentioned the dollar. That was also one of the things that... Uh, Makes me scratch my head. Huh? We see this dollar strength. And uh, one of the explanations I had, especially while at the same time treasuries are tanking, uh, as a thought process, if we have this situation, which is very, uh, well, 
unsatisfying, let's put it that way, especially from a German point of view in our economy. On uh, This morning just came out German industrial production, uh, again, uh, worse than expected, yeah? came down minus 0.2, expected minus uh, uh, 0.1. Um, is there actually dollar flowing into the United States from European industrial and it's not going into treasuries, it's going into real assets. Yeah? Uh, the simple thought from a market maker, okay, if I'm not happy with our uh, industrial base we have here and with the insecurities, the energy prices, the food supply, pretty much everything we have on the cards at the moment, I would rather invest my money into real assets in the United States. You mentioned BASF building a factory there for $10 billion. So they need dollars to do that. Sell your treasuries have the dollars in cash, invest them in real assets. There is a dollar shortage. You can explain that to us uh, uh, in the market that makes the dollar go through the roof, which in itself is building up to a nightmare scenario in the medium to long term. Yeah, I mean, okay, there's a number of themes here. One is the overall confidence, right? If you go and have a look at IPOs, you go and have a look at bond issues, you go and have a look at venture capital um, money, you know, this, this is, it's, I won't say it's disappeared, but these are at very, very low levels. And that already gives you a sign that risk capital just, it's not there right now. So globally, people are wondering, um, you know, what limited capital they've got to invest. Where should they put it? I mean, that really is a, you know, problem number one. Problem number two is all of this geopolitics that's sort of flying around. So, you know, should I be investing in, in Asia? If so, where should I be investing in Asia? So from a purely investment perspective, what's going on? We talked about treasuries. You said it's not just sort of treasuries or it isn't treasuries. It is treasuries from Europe, from UK in the last two or three years, two years, I think. Um, the Europeans and the UK have been big investors in treasuries. Yeah. Their holdings of treasuries, and now the EU, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, the EU is the largest holder of treasuries. And I don't mean the governments, it's not a central bank thing. This is investors. Now, why are they, why are normal investors investing in treasuries? Well, probably, you know, for the points we made in the past, um, if you're going to put your money in, in somewhere, where do you have most confidence? Which government do you have most confidence? Okay, so people invest in the state. Then there was this industrial thing. Germany is going through this deindustrialization because the economic policies of the Greens, I mean, the Green sort of part of this coalition, um, you know, the Habeck sort of economic part, the, the foreign policy part, both aspects of their policies are anti-business. Uh, so, you know, we, we're talking about being frightened off to invest or, or do business with China on the one side, and on the other side, not having energy security if you're an industrial company. So where do people invest as a company? So we talked about BASF. Actually, BASF invested $10 billion in a plant early in the year um, in, in China. In China, um, not the US, yeah. But, but they are also, I mean, companies, if, if they're looking to expand their production or move their production, they're moving it to America or somewhere else, but anywhere but here, because there's no certainty here. And what you need if you're if you're looking to invest is that the right kind of environment. And today Germany and the German government doesn't offer you that that certainty about policy and and uh, and the like. So people are making the choice, if I'm going to move somewhere, I'd move somewhere else. And the Americans, what did they do? They spent originally $350 billion on a inflation, so-called so Inflation Reduction Act, which is nothing more than just sort of helping companies produce stuff, right? Which is, which is what you need in an inflationary environment is, you know, we talked about this as well, um, is, is the notion of you need to go make stuff if you want to reduce inflation. And the only solution that the Europeans come up with is is, is sort of more um, uh, policies which, which constrain business or the, the central bank just says, well, you know, we just sort of jack up the rates and there's no compensation of, uh, you know, from the government to encourage investment. So... I mean, if you were a businessman in, in, in Europe, Germany especially, then, then I can understand those people who have moved outside. And, and therefore, it goes back and explains the votes that you saw in Bayern and in, in, in Hesse, um, you know, which are sort of anti the existing coalition. 
taking this all into consideration, um, on very, very simple terms, and I'm a simple man, yeah? I buy stuff that goes up and I sell stuff that goes down. And uh, I like volatility when it's cheap and I sell it when it's expensive. A strong economy always produces bonds which are yielding very, very low. Yeah? Now we have Italy, my case at the moment, which is reliant, like all the, the other countries in trouble, on a strong German industrial base. We've just established, we see the situation as an entrepreneur or a, a businessman in Europe. Yes, you would go to a country uh, or countries which have energy security, which have a code of law, uh, which can feed their populations. If I look at that, are there anything uh, on the credit default swap side that tells me there is a bigger risk theme playing on here, or is it again just us talking and reading the economists and saying, "Oh, yeah, Italy is doing really bad." Can you see anything in the data, Nick? So again, we are at levels which are obviously higher than we were some months ago in in all credit def uh, credit default swaps, um, but we are at levels which are lower than where we were during crisis of let's just say October, the guilt crisis or in May this year in America, where there was this debt ceiling crisis of default risk. So we're still at levels which is lower than where we were. I mean, we are at elevated levels. You could argue um, that, you know, for somebody looking for cheap insurance somewhere in their portfolio, this is possibly cheap insurance. But there's been so many occasions where there's been cheap insurance that at the end of the day, it's actually becomes really expensive over a long period of time because paying insurance and not getting a payoff. And you have to kind of look forward and say, well, what is the solution to all of this stuff? What's going on right now? And is it likely that there's going to be a default? And, you know, if you think sorry, be a default, just get out. That would have that would have been my next question. What's the toolkit of the ECB? Mrs. Lagarde was quoted, yeah, we're not looking at absolute levels now, we're looking at spreads. Yeah, okay, fine. You might as well say nothing uh, because she didn't define which kind of spreads. What could the ECB do if your thesis that we're not seeing 6 7 8% in Italy, if the market blows out, a market gets nervous, the ECB can't sit on the sidelines and just accept that. What can they do? What will they do? And does it make any sense, Nick? <laughs> Does the ECB make any sense? Um, that, that's, that's a real question. Um, the video will be blanked if I say what I think there. But Let, uh, let's start with what can they do? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the ECB have one job, right? And that is to keep the Euro, Euro together. I mean, that's it. If, they, if the Euro falls apart, then they can go home. Right. And this notion of, well, let's just sort of um, jack up interest rates because our American friends are jacking up interest rates and we we don't want to fall behind. We don't want to you know, we think that that's that's probably the right thing. We don't know where that we created inflation. So what they they do is they, they jack up interest rates. But if they were in any way fearing that they have turned the screw too much, their first mission, actually, there are two things. They need to be watching the politics with their left eye. Um, because if the politics go the wrong way in Europe, then they've also done something wrong. If people start to dream about sort of a, a, a Europe without Europe, as it were, sort of yeah. separate policies, and if there is anything that they can do, then they will do that. And the other thing with their right eye is they will be looking at spreads. And, you know, you said that she is going to be looking at them. Good, good for her. Um, and if she honestly felt that there was something in, in danger of any one of these economies, and that includes the very small countries, um, they cannot afford this thing to have another sort of 2011 crisis, as it were, where that one's going to leave and that one's going to leave. Um, uh, because if they have that type of crisis, then the euro is, is truly over. So the way, the way that they would handle that is go back to that playbook, which they said that they weren't going to go back to, you know, when they copied the policies of the American uh, Central Bank, that they should say, OK, well, um, the Italy spreads are far too wide on a relative basis to Germany. I don't think they are right now, but let's just say they decide that that is. Um, and um, and then they'll, they'll go in there and, and they'll adjust their balance sheet. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll either go and buy, you know, more, more Italy and sell some Germany or just go and buy more Italy and then and they'll increase their balance sheet. So say 
Same thing in Americans, the Fed. The Fed screw up, right? Then they've got one thing to kind of make things right again, and that's go and buy stuff. You saw that when the SVB thing fell apart. Yeah. What did they do? You know, they go and chuck a lot of liquidity in the system and they say, oh, we get, we take, we take the treasuries apart, even though they've fallen 30 points. And what did the Bank of England do? One year, sort of this week, this month, whatever, um, we're crazy, crazy, whatever. Um, they went and bought, they said, no, we're not, we are QT, we're quantitative tightening, we're selling out, we're rolling off our, our sort of guilt from our balance sheet. What did they do as soon as uh, the, the guilt market fell apart? when volatility was just far too great for the pension companies and insurance companies, they just went in there and bought a load of gilts. So they increased their balance sheet. It's what they do every time, and it's what the ECB would do if there was a problem. So the clearest path for the future we have right in front of us is a euro of stagflation, right? Because they will have to print money, call it as you may, um, but at the same time, the economy is in a slump. So we I will hope not. But you know, you can't. That isn't that is an alternative. And if that is an alternative, that's a bad alternative. Yeah. If that were the case, right? Yeah, that would be bad for. I think it would be bad for equities. That would be you know good for commodities. You know, the ideal is really a kind of a shallow recession where these sort of central banks, you know, reduce, you know, un untighten the screw a little bit, um, um, encourage a little bit of lend, increase their balance sheet a little bit. Keep the thing going whilst the politicians make the right decisions about policies as opposed to the wrong decisions. And, and that's the kind of the big problem. That's why you need to, that's why you're seeing a, a vote from voters to say that the current, the incumbents in government are just not doing it. And that was my original thesis because the voters clearly say, no, we don't want that. Uh, the guys who are now two more years in charge and uh, like to have their private jets and their uh, special cars, their default position was, oh, we haven't tried enough socialism, so we have to increase that. And the coalition most likely will not fall apart because they know, especially the liberals, which used to be my, uh, my base camp, they know they're dead huh? in, in both cases. Yes. At least they have two more years to turn it around a little bit. But if they would now uh, uh, let the government uh, implode, I don't want to even call it explode. It would be just an elation into nowhere. They will not give up. So we have two more years of this madness going on uh, with more green initiatives and more redistribution and higher taxes. They're all talking about it now. So it will hit Germany. It will not increase the wealth we are all producing. Then we have these countries. We haven't spoken about Spain. It's not that exciting at the moment. But Italy, where I really have an eye on, say, okay, they have another 70 billion pending out of some EU funds to make up for the corona uh, shortcomings uh, they haven't been paid yet so that's obviously a screw they can turn around and say you do what but the question i'm really asking myself does that lead into anything or is it really that the market is already telling us dollar strength yes we've used this uh, analogy a couple of times the the cleanest shirt in the dirt hamper where do you want to put your money let's bring it into the united states at least they have a fighting chance They they do, but um, you know, here coming back to what we talked about earlier about stability and confidence yeah. uh, created. Um, currently, the the government there um, aren't portraying any kind of confidence, and you know whether we we haven't talked about um, um, you know the the Israeli situation yeah. uh, uh, and Hamas, but you know the the American you know government. Is is also falling apart right now. So, so the world's policeman um, is actually a, is is either asleep or his hands are tied um, at critical junctures. And and if you really say that the America is the solution to everything, well, they need a, a, a budget control much better than what they've got today, and they need to have a government which is there all the time, stable. And at the moment, we've had this year, we've had. Threatens of a threats of of uh, um, default from the you know how how dare you right is what I say to that. Then they have th threats of you know a shutdown, which is not a default, but just shutting down the government. Um, and then they get rid of the speaker of the house, um, where they you know having you know 
decisions are just, you know, how can they make decisions right now? So the rest of the world is looking at the policeman and saying, where is he? And so they're going, you know, the, the world kind of, this is the reaction you get when the world is, is looking at the policeman who's not doing his job right now. And so America is... It may be the, if that's the cleaner shirt, it's bloody dirty is all I can say. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. You just mentioned Israel, what happened over the weekend, right? Uh, we have now a situation where I'm only listening to the news, so I'm just repeating what I have. So obviously you have Hamas attacking Israel. Israel is saying we are now in a war. Uh, first question is, does everybody think, oh, it's like it used to be over the last 50 years? Yeah, uh, Israel gets attacked, they defend themselves, and then the news uh, cycle peters out. Or is that something bigger? Because what I'm hearing at the moment is that Iran obviously got uh, his hands in in the game. They wanted to jeopardize the the friendly posture between Saudi Arabia and Israel that was on the cards, which is now out of the window. Um, Israel the policeman is asleep, is all I can say. To exactly. The United States, I've heard, has just moved uh, weapons, stocks and supplies from Israel into Ukraine to help the Ukrainians. Yeah. And, and they moved a, a large ship somewhere in the Med. Yeah. Time, ti timing wise. And then you see that obviously that came as an extreme surprise for Israel being uh, attacked. They were trading a VIX of nine. Yeah. They were not on high alert at all. They thought, okay, fine, and were completely surprised. And that's a massive attack. It's also a head scratcher. When you think uh, the Mossad has a reputation of being the best secret service in the world, um, how could something like that happen? So we have a geopolitical situation now uh, where Saudi is miffed with Iran, as usual. Uh, Saudis might have had a friendlier relationship with Israel. That's off the cards now. You have the Russians who are being supported by Iran in uh, ammunition supplies. So the Russians will take back their support they used to have for peaceful relations in Israel. We still have the war in the Ukraine going on, where now you saw, uh, brought it in. The Senate said, now we're, we're, we're not allowing the president to give you money. Uh, because we don't have a speaker yet, and that's not going to happen. Uh, at the same time, the president comes out, and oh, we're going to do it anyway, somehow, uh, where you think, what is going on here? Uh, just while we were on air, I saw a headline on CNBC, Chi, breaking news, said the, uh, the bilateral relationships between the United States and China are the most important in the world. I tend to believe that. Huh? And with this whole crisis uh, now going on in, in the Middle East, I thought, bloody hell. Do we have to ask China to sort that crap out because the policeman of the world is unable to do it? Because it must be in China's interest to actually quiet this whole thing down. If oil prices explode because there is a huge lack in supply, suddenly the Americans are realizing that their strategic, you saw that chart as well, went viral this week, that they have strategic petroleum reserve good for 17 days. Yeah? Uh, wow. Wow. Are, yeah, are, I, we on, I, I, are we on a real powder cake here? Um, uh, being uh, <clears throat> being initiated through this, what's going on right at the moment, and people haven't seen it yet, or am again uh, the guy who p loves to buy volatility and think, oh yeah, that's right in my book. I mean, you know, this sort of U.S. supply uh, of oil, and and I, I I didn't see the chart. I saw the chart when it was forty six days, so seventeen days. I did see as a headline. I didn't see the chart, but I mean, America is is able to produce its own oil. It's yeah. it's kind of self sufficient in in oil. Whether it's got the right type of oil, um, which what they need is gasoline. Uh, I'm I'm really not the expert on that, but the you know this notion of of geopolitics and china and america schumer is uh, is is um is seeing she today so there is a you know uh, yeah, yeah. Senators are on a, a tour um and they they meet and and that's why he is you know she has said that uh, today and and rightly so but you know the politics in around the world is you know, we, we have this sort of world policemen steal the Americans because they have a biggest army and they flex their muscles and they're everywhere and everyone kind of understands that and nobody's going to stand in their way. Um, but then there is sort of this a different type of, of, of power shift and that's the economic power. And the economic power with China, with America, um, you know, they are fairly balanced and competing. 
Um, and, and, you know, every now and then, you know, it's, it's important to understand the differential there that, that at the moment, China is not trying to flex its muscles militarily. It's trying to say that, you know, you know, there's a world here. We, you know, there's enough resources for everyone. We should work for mutual benefit. Um, and, you know, we're, 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 we are building up our army, but we are not moving, you know, like like the Americans um, did in the past. But the the sort of the combination of America and uh, China is very important because they control everything. You know, between the two of them, they they kind of control the world. Um, so it's important that foreign policy um, heads um, in European countries should rather sort of respect both parties rather than calling them dictators. Is, is my only comment to that. Does that all make a bullish case on however you look at it for the US dollar? Uh, but, so I'm uh, of, on the dollar thing. I, I am still of the view that the Americans need to debase uh, their currency because if it's a choice of should I defend the currency or do I defend my bond market? And I think, you know, the, the bond market has to come first. And for that reason, You know, the only way out of this problem for the Americans is to uh, if effectively print more money to base their currency. So the currency should certainly fall against other things, gold, Bitcoin, commodities of certain type. You know, that's that's one thing. Um, and around the world, well, you know, you, because the counter argument of what you say there is to say, well, then it's a combination of dollar and one, renminbi, um, you know, so because at the end of the day, if that's the balance of power, then surely you want a bit of both. And the whole idea of BRICS is to sort of kind of have an economic powerhouse, which is has a, you know, the Chinese currency is, a, is, a, is an important part of that. And gold will back that in some way, shape, or form in the future. We haven't seen Not that. everyone is, is is happy to have Chinese currency. Because mm -hmm. the, 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 well, how do you call it? The water cooler talk is uh, suddenly now developing. Uh, dollar euro parity uh, from a shorter term perspective. You know, when we spoke about Japan, that the market likes to test out these barriers, these thresholds. Yeah, that could be also something, at least medium term on the cards, cards that the market wants to see that. It's it's not an impossible thing, but for the for us to have parity, then the DXY, which is the um, the dollar index, would have to go from where is it now 106 to 111. The old high was around 115. Um, but at these levels, you see, um, you know, when you start to get this sort of close to 110. Um, and with an oil um, market, which is uh, still hot and getting hotter um, as a result of what's going on in the Middle East, then you've got this sort of double whammy for oil importing countries like Japan, like Germany. And it's not in, their, in America's interest to see two allies being, if you like, punished um, with the strong dollar. And so for that reason, they have to have a weaker dollar for the stability of the world economy. And if they don't, well, then, you know, they, they also risk uh, political um, issues. Japan will sell treasuries. Germany will sell their treasuries. People will just, they'll be forced to liquidate US. It's not in their interest. No, no I'm, I'm with you on that. It's just this, uh, there are too many things at the moment which do not run as you would them expect to do. Yeah. So in stock market in the United States, everybody was talking about we are going to see a recession, the camp I'm coming from. Then people are now talking about we are going to see a soft landing. At the same time, you saw that there was a massive decline in oil prices. So what is it? If the economy is doing excessively well, you shouldn't see a decline in oil prices. Yeah, uh, obviously, we've seen now over the weekend uh, 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 a, a tick up again. But all these different indicators put together, we see, I, I still say gold is very stable for the situation we're having at the moment. Yeah, With treasuries yielding 5%, gold at this level is actually it's strange. It should be far, far lower. Uh, but it isn't. Uh, the dollar is extremely strong. And uh, um, the economy according to well the data the data we saw on friday non-farm payrolls coming in super hot so what is it 
shouldn't oil be far, far higher, especially given the whole scenario we're seeing now, now geopolitical risks in there. The economy in the United States is doing massively well. Yeah, well, we have seen employment figures. No worry. Everybody is worried about higher for longer. Where's the breaking point? What What am I seeing wrong here? Some of these, one of these markets, maybe several <laughs> of these markets is lying, right? <laughs> you know, so I'll tell you what this reminds me of. This reminds me of episode one or episode two, when you said to me, Nick, Dr. Copper is telling us there's going to be a recession, right? And that yep. was, when was it we started this thing in March? I can't remember when it was, May, 20, weeks, 23 weeks ago, whatever that is, right? And, and I, you know, I just couldn't answer that because logically you're absolutely right yeah when you when you look at your logic map because you you understand economics you say well logically that's happening that's happening therefore therefore why don't i see the same because and the answer i think i half gave at that time and probably not the right way because i thought otherwise you would have remembered it is is the fact that the economic situation runs on a different kind of cycle path to the market situation and, and obviously, when you look at one and you look at the other, you say it does not compute. And therefore, you can quite easily make wrong market calls by sort of trying to sort of extrapolate the economic situation. And that's always very difficult. You usually find out afterwards, you know, that the market is in OK shape or not in OK shape, as the case may be. And in, in that case, when we were talking at the earlier part of this year and everyone was saying recession, 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 and I was saying, and you, you know, I was looking at the market saying, hey, there's no recession. And, you know, one of them was going to be wrong. You said that. And in the end, the market, you know, you get the, the, the forecast of GDP Q3 is 4.9%. Where's the bloody recession? And yields are at 5%. And everyone's saying hunky dory, right? I, I love to quote Ayn Rand at these points where he say, she said once uh, contradictions do not exist. If you think you came across a contradiction, take a ste step back and check your premises. So it yeah. must be our premises that the whole economic system, as we were taught it at business school and as we've Correct. observed it over decades in the markets, something's not quite right here. Correct. Correct. And you, you will understand afterwards what is really going on. But I, you know, if the... We've we've if lost the, the price. The, we've lost the price discovery mechanism of yields, haven't we? Over the last, well, I mean, uh, you, uh, you're discovering something now. Is all I can say about that. So they're, they're kind of letting you letting you find out where the right yield is now. But um, but the and and you know, be careful what you wish for. Uh, oh, well, price discovery? No, I didn't mean that. Um, you know, please stop discovering something. Get the yields back down. Look, if if the equity market sees a new high, I can justify that. I can say, yeah, I can live with that. The equity market falls apart, then it's because people have lost confidence and it's because the central banks and, and in a world where you have such huge amount of debt, which is supposedly 300, 350 trillion, right? Brilliant. With a C, um, you know, and, and 70 or 80 trillion has to be refinanced every single year. The role of banks and the shadow banking system and the central banks is so important to keep the oil in the right place. And when you get these, these sort of points where balance sheet capacity isn't there or confidence isn't there to expand your balance sheet, yeah, I mean, that's really what it's about, um, or the collateral values are sort of falling because volatility is too high, then you get this situation where and at the moment, it's sort of primarily driven by dollars flowing around the world. And the dollars don't flow around the world so easily because of all of these things that I mentioned. Then suddenly what happens is you see the effect. You suddenly see, oh, the dollar is rising. And it's not just because BASF are investing or BMW are investing in America or people are buying treasuries. It also is a signal that there's not enough liquidity. And you look at liquidity measures, central bank liquidity, and you know, it's the only thing I can see, but there are experts like cross-border capital who monitor um, you know, this thing weekly for their institutional clients. Um, yeah, and, and the message that they are also bringing out is that the that liquidity is is in decline and it's sort of it's it's bouncing on the bottom um and it's sort of tapering off. And every now and then you get this spark from China when China throws in a lot of liquidity because it needs it. And that's the only thing kind of keeping things up. It's not enough. Western central banks need to stop what they're doing, turn it around. If they don't, then 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. I think we we are at this inflection point at the moment uh, where I can relatively safely assure you, in three months we will not be at the level where we are now. We might be equity markets ten percent higher, or we might be ten percent lower. The next thing I'm going to do this week, try to find, unfortunately, volatility has already increased from the levels where I did the last straddle. Uh, now we're at levels of 20. That is actually the point where you say, fine, yeah, something is going to happen. We really don't have the ability to say, is it going to the upside? Are they going to turn the card around or is it going to the downside? Because as right. many people as are speaking about the end rally, the other part is, oh, we have 87. Yeah, The next crash is around the corner. I can't really make a judgment, but I'm getting more and more into your camp. What cannot happen will not happen. Yeah? The guys who are running the positions, they will come to, um, how did you, I call it financial crime. You called it uh, um, financial restriction or what was the expression you used? Oh, financial the, repression. Uh, yeah, oh, financial yes. rep uh, repression, which will eventually for, I don't know, another couple of five or 10 years, save the whole thing till uh, the world finally ends. But uh, that it could be requires something. policies, government policies, investment policies to keep this thing going. Because, you know, fundamentally, what you've seen since the global financial crisis, 2008, you know, the growth in the world, growth per GDP per capita, it's, it's doing this, it's coming down. Yep. And it's coming down because the policies, all, all, the only thing that we've had since 2008, it's unfair on the governments, but is, is more regulation, more restriction making things harder for people, making it more difficult for banks to lend money, making it more difficult for companies to continue. You know, we understand why. Some of these things are useful policies, yeah, taking care of pollution and all of this stuff and and and, and not sort of um, um, taking a piss, for, for a better um, word, with, uh, you know, with resources. But, um, you know, that's what's happened. And it's it's really, it's gone too far and it needs to sort of companies need to breathe again. Banks need Those, to breathe again. I, I think all these methods or all these uh, initiatives you just mentioned, they are just a tool. They're actually not the real aim. Professor Rieck, one of uh, a game theoretician in uh, Frankfurt at the university, he asked the question in one of his podcasts and it really made me think. He said a lot of people who are not believing in global warming or what needs to be done, are you actually just not believing it because you don't like what they're doing to fight it? Or if the solutions to this uh, uh, scientific problem, there is global warming, what are you going to do? Yeah, build nuclear power plants, get the best power plants online. Would you then actually accept it? And I, I thought to myself, yeah, that's actually a fantastic thought to say, yeah, fine. If the data, the scientific data tells us that there is a problem with CO2, what would be the best solution to stop it? Not what we're doing at the moment, powering right. up coal plants and taxing people. No, we should do the opposite, grow the economy. Right. And then you actually, but that is the thing where I'm always almost getting crazy. Uh, I love history books. We don't seem to learn. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there are too many ideologists in government and yeah. um, and and people who but I don't know whether they just don't understand or whether they refuse to understand or perhaps they do understand. I don't understand. But when I look at the chart, if you like, of where energy comes from today yeah. and the net zero policies, and I looked at this thing two years ago and it's certainly not improved, um, I'd say, you know, your your plans are just you're dreaming. To, to achieve that, and you are committing economic suicide for your country um, in the interim because you're forcing people down a path which won't lead to growth. And if you were transparent with your people and say, look, we're doing this to save the planet, but by the way, the economy is going to fall, you know, it's going to fall apart, right? Um, you know, then allow people the choice to make that decision or say to them, you know, it's a very important thing we're doing for the planet. Um, and we are we're going to try and find solutions that have the least negative impact on the economy. And people aren't seeing that evidence. Otherwise, you'd see more nuclear power. You know, you'd you'd see people sort of coming up with those solutions. And it's just not evident right now. And, and therefore, you really wonder why, um, you know, this government is, is acting in such a way or government. And, you know, come back to UK. Rishi, bless him. Right. <laughs> My friend. Um, Rishi has seen the writing on the wall and he's saying, actually, I realize that the trade-off between economic growth 
And these targets that we initially put in place were perhaps too tight. And perhaps we need to loosen that a little bit in order to give people time to invent new solutions for, you know, batteries that don't blow up and all sorts of very important. And he's, you know, as I said, pragmatic solutions are what's required. And that might even, you know, show the German politicians that actually a pragmatic politician yeah. can turn things around. We have the problem, yeah. Rishi is at least officially running the Conservative Party, which is running the government. He has another two years as well. And at yes. the moment in the polls, Labour looks very good. So he had to shift to the Conservative base again. And he does that out of a position of power. He can actually make economic decisions, which make sense. If he wants it or not, I don't know. But at least we know they make sense. So he's bringing them on. In Germany, we have the opposite. Yeah. We have the guys from the left running the show. They've now got uh, a slap in the face and they will most likely go into the other direction, which in a way is good for Great Britain, right? So uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you, you wouldn't believe it when you look at the currency because the UK currency is slightly weaker against the euro and you just sort of can't say, well, why, why is that? But, um, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, Rishi has the freedom to choose and, and follow that to true grassroots conservative thinking. That's what his base and wants anyway, right? Absolutely right. And 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 the you know Labour um who were in a very, very commanding lead are in a less commanding lead. And if you get sort of a spread at the moment, I think the spread's around 10 points, you know, Labour over Conservative. Um but if that spread narrows down to around five, you know, it really wouldn't surprise me if you get Rishi saying, okay, we'll do an election now. Because I think he'll have the momentum behind him um, and, and may, get, may get the vote. And the, the German politicians need to watch this. And that's Merz as well. Because, you know, he's, he's also not sort of shining where I thought he would shine. Yeah. Well, let me close with a word which always uh, fits into my larger theme. The problem in Germany we have, we don't have an Indian running the show. <laughs> yeah, it's... Sorry, I'm saying that again. Obviously, you also heard the tidbits. Uh, uh, JP Morgan is changing the index now, taking Indian government uh, uh, bonds in. Bloomberg is thinking about doing the same. Mm -hmm. uh, every, everybody actually sees where the music is playing. And obviously, it it's a little bon mot. But to say, yes, there you have Rishi Sunak, Indian descent. And he actually got the message. He was in India. He is building it up. And maybe... An Indian can save the United Kingdom. Uh, in Germany, we don't have anybody in the pipeline who could do that, at least for now. Any final words from your side, Nick, after this very extensive teach-in for me? I still haven't got my head around it, but uh, I'm working <laughs> on it. No, I, I think you, you you know that your last sentence cannot be trumped by any uh, sentence <laughs> from me. So I, I'll stick with that and I'll say that you win. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. If you like our little show, please subscribe, like, uh, share us, leave a message. We will read them. We will most likely reply. There are not a lot of comments in our. Maybe we are all too extensively talking about everything already. And uh, next week, we should be again Sunday online. And it's an exciting week. We'll have PPI. We have CPI in the United uh, States. So let's see. And I might report on, I'm looking at volatility at the moment, whether I can gobble up something which captures the upside and the downside with a nice chance risk uh, ratio in this sense thank you very much thank you very much nick and see you soon see you everyone bye-bye